Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Powerful Nothing, a Magic the Gathering podcast, where we talk cube and other magical goodness. I'm your host, Dan, better known on the internet as Too Sweet MTG, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, James. How's it going, dude? Yeah, it's going good. It's going good. I have some opinions to share on some cube-based topics, so yeah, let's let's crack on. No, definitely. We have an awesome topic for everyone today. For our main topic, we're going to be talking about white aggro in cube. Time codes will be down below if you want to jump around. Should be an awesome conversation. But first, as always, we have some news. So firstly, a bit of podcast news. We'll get that out of the way first. First up, the spoilers for Outlaws of Thunder Junction are coming thick and fast. I think the Commander decks got spoiled today at time of recording. Going to be looking at them as soon as this finishes. Going to start making some notes because obviously we will have our set review for Cube. Make sure you follow the podcast so that you get notified when that comes out. That's going to be a good one. There seems to be a lot of cool cards in this set. Have you have you seen many of the spoilers, James? Are you keeping up with that? Um, I don't normally teeth up with fun spoilers, but I've seen a few and they look pretty pushed, actually. Um... I think this is going to be a pretty impactful one for Cube. Well, we know there's at least one Oko. Um, yeah, this is in the same sort of slot as March the Machine, kind of like the end of storyline thing. Although, although I think from, a, from, from specifically a storyline point of view, this isn't the end of the storyline, but it's just full of a lot of powerful, impactful, cool characters. And they all need magic cards, so let's go. It should be a lot of fun. And obviously, Yeeha. Yeeha, James. Yeah, the um, the <laughs> artwork does seem exceptionally lazy. It seems like they've just taken other artwork and put cowboy hats on literally every character. But, you know, yeehaw indeed. <laughs> well, taking artwork is something we'll get onto in a little bit. But before we do that, um, uh, some other podcast news. Both me and James will be at Magic on Amsterdam. I know this is a podcast and you probably don't know what we look like, but if you hear us, come and say hello. <laughs> Um, I think we're thinking of maybe trying to record something there. We're still working out the details. But if you see two lads walking around with microphones, um, it might be us. So come and say hello if you see us or you hear us. Uh, yeah, or, yeah, it'd be awesome to meet everyone. You can also find out what Dan looks like from his YouTube channel. And if you know what Dan looks like, he is visible from <laughs> almost every part of the Magic Calm because he is unreasonably tall. So uh He's, he's just like a signpost, really. He's very easy <laughs> to find. Um, so, yeah, come and say hi. <laughs> oh, thank you, James. Thank you. <laughs> cool. So that's kind of podcasty stuff out the way. So, yeah, so our main bit of news today isn't really a fun one, but it is something I think that's worth discussing. So, unfortunately, it looks like we've had another case of plagiarism in Magic the Gathering art. So we'll kind of go through the facts at the moment and kind of then we'll have a bit of a discussion about it. So... Um, Faye Dalton's art for Trouble in Pairs has been accused of lifting sections of it, particularly a person with a red mohawk, from a cover art from a Cyberpunk 2020 novel called The Ravagers, uh, originally illustrated by Donato Giancola. Uh, this was, like most things nowadays, found out on Reddit. Um, people did go through looking for other instances of alleged plagiarism. They didn't. I don't think people found any from other bits of art, but they might have found more in this particular piece of art and i'm not saying it's a trend but we have had a couple of notable bits recently like end of last year we had uh, david sondered um accused of uh stealing part of the artwork for uh the wayfarers bauble art from caverns of ixalan we also had a couple of years before jason felix uh plagiarized a version of crux of fate again I'll put links down in the description to the relevant images so you can compare them for, for yourself and make your own judgment, I guess. Some of this is allegedly, some of this has been confirmed. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm choosing my words a little bit carefully. Um, it does kind of suck when this kind of thing happens. I've kind of got, I've got my opinions of it, on it, James, but I think I'll kind of start with you. What, what did you feel when you heard this and what's your initial impression of the issue? Yeah, it really sucks. Um, uh Again, caveat: if if this, uh, these allegations are true and the work is plagiarized, it's you know looking at the other art that this artist has done, they clearly you know would have been capable of drawing those parts of that picture themselves, right? Um, so I guess this is more just a thing of laziness and um, wanting to get a bunch of commission stuff done really quickly. Um, I don't know if that speaks to how the Wizards Commission stuff is valued at this point by by artists. But um yeah, it's 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 pretty sad to me if, if this is proved to be true. Because obviously it's like it's yeah, it's pretty indefensible behavior really in terms of like, you know, this work for from another artist, even in the same field. And uh yeah, I, I just going around and lifting uh 
basically copy and pasting or I don't know tracing over uh, segments of their pictures is, seems yeah. to be be in that be strong allegation. I don't know. Um, so yeah, that's pretty sad. I don't know. Yeah, if this is reflective of um, the uh, this commission not being as highly prized by artists as it might have used to be because. Um, you know, obviously, this is so it will certainly be the end of this artist's work with Wizards of the Coast if if the allegations are proved to be true. Yeah, I think uh, so. So on that point, the um the last two that we mentioned who have been, I guess, accused and found out for um or or at least accused of of stealing artwork haven't worked with Wizards before. I'm, there is kind of like a fine line. So so, so so you mentioned like tracing. Then I think there was another one which I couldn't find, which I definitely saw online, but could, didn't see the. I didn't write it down before doing the episode, but um there was accusations of someone else like tracing over a piece of artwork that kind of thing or like tracing over a picture um i think it was particularly a line kind of there was a fine line between tracing over an inspiration and some of this some of these ones that we're talking about like it is like photoshop cut out put in and that's kind of when it's lifted directly it is a bit it's it is harder to defend I, so, so, so we kind of briefly t- spoke about this over the weekend and then we thought no on, wait, let's save this for the podcast because that's unfortunately how we have real life conversations now <laughs> it's like no wait this conversation is too good um but one of the things that we're kind of touched on is like i'm not defending the act of stealing someone else's work that i don't that that i agree you can't defend i am sympathetic to possibly the reasons behind it because this person would have seen what has happened to other people who have been accused of effectively play, of, of, of plagiarizing artwork the only reason why i think that this is done because 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 to get to the point where you do magic art you have to be a good artist like they're not they're not it's not alpha they're not picking people they know anymore it is you have to have a good uh, portfolio basically like like the main reason i think this has happened is purely uh time um you'd be alarmed how many more mistakes and how many people cut corners when just time isn't a factor. And the reason behind that, I don't know, maybe they took on more than they could handle, or I'm going to be honest with you, from someone who, like, I have a very loose connection with Wizards. Like, it's kind of like, um, well, at the moment, I don't really have, like, like, at the moment, myself and the channel and the podcast don't have any relationship with Wizards or anything like that. Previously, we've had a bit of support, kind of, uh, there was someone to talk to, but there was a large amount of layoffs at Wizards last year, and it's meant that just like a lot of things like you hear tangentially from people are kind of either not being done or there's no one to do it. So th- there could definitely be either like a quality assurance thing that is not being done. Like like people used to, maybe used to, like maybe the reason we're seeing more of this now is people aren't checking as much or, the, or there isn't anyone to check it. Or maybe because the person who would have given out the time frame for this got let go or something like that. And now there's like the time frames on how how long people have to do their art is shorter and that's why we're seeing more of it now that could be a reason again i'm kind of postulating and I, I, yeah I, i'm not trying to fully defend it but i can be sympathetic to potential reasons why basically is what i'm saying yeah i mean listen i think um everyone's made a bad decision under pressure at some point in their life and you know we don't know what is going on with this especially like I'm, I'm not saying they're like an awful human being but um I think this was a really bad decision that they made if if that is what's happened. And um yeah, I think it's uh it's it's probably for the best if yeah, they're not back on magic cards for a while because it's um I don't think that's uh that's a precedent they want to set really. Oh definitely. And I agree. I think this does kind of fall into maybe a bigger conversation about AI art and how um people feel about wizards using that in the future. Um, but that's not a conversation for now, I think. I think that's a conversation once we see a bit more of it and see, hopefully, it's not a thing that they're going to do, but I guess we'll, yeah, wait and see on that. Yeah, sadly, I'm sure it is coming, but uh, <laughs> we, we'll deal with that when we come to it. All right, so with that discussion out of the way, let's move on to our main topic of the day. So we're going to be doing another deep dive into an archetyping cube. Today, we're doing one that, on its face, could be considered kind of simple but it is i think the more we talk about it the more you'll see the depth to it today we're going to be talking about white aggro in cube so james do you want to kind of kick it off a little bit so where do you primarily see white aggro is it like from from my experience it seems to be a lot of places but kind of where have you experienced it and where have you come across white aggro in cube yeah, I think and white aggro certainly crops up in basically every power level of cube, right? Um, from obviously it's a big thing in like powered cube, but right down to like proper cube, white aggro, white weenie is, is pretty legit. Um and I think pretty much everywhere in between. I think 
mostly the cubes you don't see it in are the cubes that have made a very explicit decision not to include it really to yeah <laughs> yes that's a very good point actually yeah <laughs> like as we'll kind of go on we'll kind of give examples of some of the cards that you see in all the different power level of cubes but yeah yeah it is something that kind of is is kind of everywhere because it's one powerful two relatively cheap and three it's kind of it has bits that yeah 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 at, at every rarity so in theory any cube can put a decent mono white aggro list together but kind of we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit so james talk to me about white aggro what is the deck actually trying to do what like what is the goal of the archetype what are you picking your cards to do what are you building towards as you play a game of magic with white aggro Sure. So the number one thing you're doing in the early terms of a game is you want to get on board early and apply pressure, like almost every aggressive deck. Um, and there are some games where your opponent won't be able to cope with that pressure and the game will end really quickly, and that's great, and you take your win and move on. But the really nice thing about by aggro is that is not its only route to victory. It has really good tools to keep, keep using its mana really well into the mid and late game. It can disrupt your opponents really well. It has excellent removal at this point. Um, a lot of that removal comes with a body, which is really nice. That keeps the pressure on. I think stuff like Skyclave Apparition, Lauren of the Third Path. And then you can get into your fours and fives, and especially in the higher power level cubes, those fours and five, those fours especially can can snowball like like fours from other colors really can't. Um Think about your like palace jailers and your initiative creatures, and and even just the, the white planeswalkers. Are, are, there's some really excellent ones like Gideon is a can is a really hard card to beat if it can't be directly answered. No, definitely. Kind of one thing you just mentioned is I, I think white has specifically benefited the most from like ancillary products and ancillary rule sets, like like specifically rules that are made for multiplayer that should not have found their way into single player but have so like like, like white I th- white I, I think i think especially white has the definitely the best monarch creatures and the best initiative creatures and has definitely got a big power boost from those in the last couple of years yeah for sure and um and it's not to say that white aggro isn't good if you don't because obviously a lot of cubes don't want to include those cards but they do have the best ones like i think Pals Jaleo is certainly the best monarchy creature. Um, and uh, yeah, White has, I think, the two best initiative creatures. Um, but it's not just that those cards are better than the equivalent cards in other colors. It's also they play better in White, mm-hmm. white Aggro than they do in other colors because you're generally going to be ahead on board and you have excellent removal. So you're really well set up to stop, to take the monarchy, keep the monarchy. Uh, not let your opponent get it back and if somehow they do manage to get it back they have an evasive creature that you can't answer well you're going to have a board presence in this deck so you're going to be able to take it back from your opponent again so it utilizes those mechanics exceptionally well no no definitely 100 um one thing just on kind of the makeup of the card so kind of like when we say aggro like i'm not going to use i'm going to the classic mono white aggro card is like savannah lions there's a single white for a two one um looking at cubes out there that is the base of a number of the one drops kind of like like how so so how important is raw stats in this aggro deck or are we looking for some kind of upside or some kind of utility as well as the raw stat line or kind of can your deck get away with having a balance of both certainly in power cube and legacy power cube uh just just for stats i'm really going to cut it at one um like you might play them, but they're they're not your best options. And it's worth noting, you know, this isn't like you know those white weenie decks you see in standard, where it's just like a bunch of one tops and some anthems, and nothing else really matters. Um, you can have an, a a perfectly fine white weenie deck without a bunch of ones. It's um, it's not a huge issue. Um, you need twos absolutely, but you, you know, it's not like oh, I need five one drops or my deck sucks. Um, when we talk about one drops in this sense. Really, what we're talking about is the cards we want to curve out with on starting on turn one. So I'm not really including here stuff like Swords to Plowshares, which while sometimes you'll play it on one, that's not really a card you're planning to play on turn one. You won't play it on turn one most games you have it in your opener. Um, even more so, obviously, like Path to Exile, which you, is borderline illegal to cast on turn one. It's so bad for you. Um, what has to go wrong for you to have played Path to Exile on turn yeah, one? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's really rough. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're, we're really talking about the cards you want to proactively get on the board on turn one. And of those, I think, 
stuff in the power cubes. I think Mother of Runes is certainly the strongest. Um, just because you have a bunch of really impactful creatures later down the curve, and protecting those is great. Um, and with Mother of Runes specifically compared to Giver, it can protect itself. So um, if they can't kill it immediately, it's really tough to kill because they have to basically sink two removal spells into it. Um, and it just has utility. And like People kind of underutilize this part of it, I think. It can just block ever- anything. You just block and give it protection from itself. Like, yeah, you're opening up to removal, but um, in a tight spot, that can, can certainly be a very useful aspect of a card. So yeah, like Muffer of Runes is number one. Um, Outside of that, like Giver is great as well for similar reasons, but obviously without the um, protecting itself. Um, Trigger of Destiny, if you're actually mono white or, or white red, uh, we'll talk about splashing later, um, is, but it's very good. Um, it does get a lot worse if you have like basics of another color in your deck, though, or if you just have a ton of colorless lands, because um, you really want to be able to pay that, uh, that triple red white hybrid. Um, outside of that, you can all the ones that are in the cubes are fine. You'll play them; they help you get on board early. But it kind of doesn't necessarily help matter which ones you have. Um, Usher of the Fallen is really nice with Skull Clamp. I'll give it that. But it's um, yeah, it, it's it's not super important which which of the other ones you have. Um, it's nice to have a few ones, but um, it, it's not like you need like five or six of them in every deck. Um, just one last one, one drop I want to touch on, um, or I guess two now. We love the Raven Inspector and Novice Inspector, don't we? The fact that they're also both commons is fantastic. Oh, yeah, great cards. Um, probably should have mentioned them, actually. But, um, yeah, these are just really, like, they're ways to help you get on board early that don't cost you a card, right? And that's great. Um, they have some nice synergies as well with uh, if you have ETB effects. Um, you can keep accruing a little... Uh, if you have flicker effects so in your deck, you can keep accruing a little bit of value in that way. Um, but yeah, fairly solid cards, nothing bad to say about them. Nice. And then moving on to two drops, kind of what are we looking at? Like, I know, like, Thalia Garden of Thraber has got to be in here, the one on a white first strike that makes some creature spells one generate more to cast. Um, what kind of else are we looking at here? Yeah, Thalia is certainly great. Um, it is worth noting with Thalia... Because a lot of the good threats they've printed recently have wound up being like non-creature spells, you know, looking at the um oh, yeah, this is nothing to a fury, does it? Well, I mean, it, I mean, it dies to a fury, but it doesn't <laughs> make yeah. it cost more. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But also, a lot they've printed a decent amount of cards that make creatures that you will put in your deck, but aren't actually creatures. Uh, so okay. you can end up getting taxed by Falia quite a bit as well. So just think about stuff like the um. What's a Fimiridon living weapon? Um, oh, the one that's good that I, that I need to pick up one of. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Glimmer Lens? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think about stuff like the Glimmer Lenses, and then if you're, if you're like looking at your fours and all your fours are Planeswalkers and stuff, that really hurts having Falia in play all of a sudden. Um, so you do want to be careful with it. Like, I'm barely cutting it, but um, if you're like a, fir- a 14 creature deck, it is not premium anymore. Um, and you will want to board it out when your opponent has a lot of creatures in those spots. Um, yeah, certainly a very strong card, and in the right matchup with the right deck, it can be absolutely absurd. It can be the best card in your deck. Um, outside of that, I think Stoneforge Mystic probably has the highest upside of your options here, um, because, but you really need the right package of equipment to go and get with it. Um, so this is obviously the tutor and equipment into your hand, and then you can pay one or white, tap it to put the equipment into play. So the ideal setup is you want Ideally, Cauldra Complete, Batter Skull is a fine substitute, um, as like the one of really expensive equipment you can go and get and cheat that that casting cost. Um, and but then I think really importantly, you want like at least one other piece of equipment, like a castable one as a backup thing to get when you've drawn that, or as a something to get in the spot where, you know, you pay your stone forge, your opponent has passed with a red and a black mana up, and you're just like, this is never surviving. If I go and get my Cauldra Complete, kind of just one for one that did yeah. this call because I'm never casting the culture where you can just be like, oh well, I'll go and get my skull clamp or something instead. And then I've got a really nice two for one if they kill the stone forge. No, I think that's fair. So so from my personal experience, I think culture is more one for high power like for for the higher powered levels, specifically in white aggro. Once you're kind of once you go down the power level a, a bit, I think you do need to be getting ones 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 that you can cast as a back up because you will draw these cards out of sequence like i guess half the time so kind of like like i think cauldron is good when you're in cubes that have like 
Soul Ring and like Moxon and, and and like City of Traitors and like Ancient Doom, that kind of stuff. If you're in a slightly lower powered level cube that isn't running that kind of fast manner, I think something well, well just personally, I think like to be fair, just like I'm not gonna say bone splitter, but like Shadow Spear, I mean like yeah. so, something like that I think is more a more of a higher pick in the lower powered level cubes. Yeah, no, no, for sure, for sure. It's it's very matchup dependent culture as well. Like against the guys where they're never killing your Stoneforge Mystic, I will put the culture in my deck. Yeah, even if I'm sometimes gonna draw it and it's gonna be bad. But like at times I draw draw my Stoneforge and uh and put it into play on turn three, it's it's really hard to beat that card, you know. Um the you can't kill it, you can't really kill the uh you can't block the thing. It's it's really tough to deal with. Um no, definitely. Um, just just some more, just kind of, I guess, more aggro using quotation marks there. Um, of the cards, um, cards like uh, Luminarch Aspirant seems like a really good one. That's the one white one one. The beginning of combat on your turn, you can put a counter on target creature you control. Like that snowballs very quickly in an aggressive deck. Um, that seems like a great one in a in a white aggro. And then you just have like raw stats and some annoying. So so so. This is kind of moving the twos onto something I wanted to touch on, but kind of like, like you also have guys like a Donto Vanguard that can protect itself while also attacking as a as a three one. You have guys like Spellbook Vendor, which is a similar type of effect to the Lunar Aspirant scene play. I kind of, what's your opinion on these? On these, effectively, these are in here to kill your opponent type guards. Like these put power on the board and not much else. Like, what's your opinion on those? Yeah, you kind of need some of them. You need to be doing something proactive on two. Um... Beyond, like, I mean, yeah, Aspirant and Smuggler's Copter are both excellent, um, but I kind of feel like beyond those, in the context of most of the more powerful cubes, like, there's a bunch of them in there, they're all pretty good, it kind of doesn't matter which ones you have, you want, like, four to five proactive two drops, that beyond those premium ones, I kind of feel like they all do a decent job, um, like, you, you know, you get a Spellbook vendor or something is a bit worse than Luminar Casper, but you know, you will live with it. Um, the um, not to say there aren't like, like there are matchups where some are better than worse, and you can definitely get a bit of an edge by um, if you end up with more of these than you need by choosing the ones you want. Like to take two like really comparable cards, like Seasoned Hallow Blade versus a Danto Vanguard, a Danto Vanguard much better against controlling decks because you don't care about paying the life and you don't want to be discarding cards. Seasoned Hallow plays way better against aggro decks because it blocks really well. It blocks as a 3 1, whereas um, Vanguard only blocks a 1 1. And you'd often rather discard a card from Pay for Life from those matchups. So those are definitely edges to be looking for. You want to be tuning your deck post board for, for what you are playing against. Um, but in terms of like how you take these cards during the draft, um, you need a decent amount of them, but you it's kind of okay as whichever ones you end up with. Yeah. Prioritize Copter, prioritize Falia, prioritize Stoneforge if you get the right pieces. Um, beyond those, they basically all do the job. So, kind of um, sticking with those style of creatures, and I'll kind of circle back on some other ones I want to talk about. Um, moving on to three now, we're kind of—I feel we're getting towards the top of the curve, as it were. If we are, <laughs> if we are near that go, kind of. What's your favorite three drops? Kind of, I've been quite impressed by like, Adeline, Adeline, Resplendent, Cathar recently um this is a very solid three drop um what do you like in th- in in threes james kind of what kind of cards stick out to you mm-hmm. so i guess we should start off by saying that if it is in your cube this is probably a minority of cubes at this point but if it is in your cube white plume adventure yes. is the best free by a million miles uh you should take it over almost every card we're, we're talking about <laughs> here barring power it's uh the card's really stupid it is, um it is coming out of mine in the next update yeah, yeah, it's, it's um, really good. <laughs> yeah, it snowballs so quickly. It is you're really well set up to keep the initiatives we said, um, and your opponents will be very dead in very short order. Um, outside of that, um, really like Adeline. Adeline, n- nice thing, to, great thing to play on turn three. You can often get your one one right away, so you've at least got something out of it. In bit if they answer it, and that fourth point of toughness means that you know dodges your lightning bolts, chain lightnings, all that stuff. That's great. Um, I guess sort of the other end of the aggression scale here, but Skyclave Apparition is a really, really nice one. Um, so I think what, one of the things that's really nice about White's Removal Suite is that it tends to exile, and it tends to, a lot of them hit any permanent, 
which means that even if you're not up against a creature deck, like Skyclave Apparition feels like it's always great, you know? Mm-hmm. It goes up to four, it can just, you know, you can just like, you know, you play your two drop, you play this on three and kill their signet, and you're just so far ahead. Um, yeah, that that's a really nice one. And then you have a bunch of ones which have some synergy with each other. You have a lot of good ETBs here. Um, think like Blade Splicers and the like. Um, and if you have a bunch of those, then Flicker Wisp becomes a really, really strong card. Um, and there's actually Flicker Wisp, there's also the nice combo with, um, because you have a few ways to blink your opponent's stuff in Mono White, there, there are times you also want to main deck something like a Containment Priest, which then combos really well with your Flicker Wisp because you can just exile their fi- uh, creature and it doesn't come back. Um, and then, but obviously Flicker Wisp, yeah, primary use case, blink your ETB, it's a free one flyer. That's great. Um, and then you've got, you can even go deeper and play stuff like Ephemerate if you have a ton of ETBs. But yeah, outside of that, you know, you want you want some good f- address free dot creatures, but this is also a turns where you'd be starting to maybe play some removal spells on your opponent's creatures as well. Um, so if they go in nicely here, you, you can play stuff like um, Touch of a Spirit Realm is fine because it, it gives you that modality of you can flicker your own creature to protect it from a removal spell or re-trigger an ETB. Or you can just owing their thing, and that's that's really nice flexibility to have. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. And then, kind of moving up the curve, we're at fours now. So, can't imagine we're running too many here. I'm assuming the ones we are running have to be super impactful. Kind of like what do most keeps going on? I'm seeing things like yeah, we mentioned Palace Jailer earlier. Good uh, comes in, makes sure the monarch can, gets rid of a threat. And then is is Gideon Allies Endicar still as strong as I think it is in 2024? It's fine. There are quite a few that are better. Um, I think this is kind of a point in the curve where we start to see a real difference between the like legacy vintage power level cubes and the slightly lower power level cubes, right? Because you're... Um... What are you saying about Glimmer Stag, James? <laughs> <laughs> nothing at all, Daniel. Nothing at all. Um, but, you know, it, it one and two drop, you're, you know... You'll play your, you know, your Savannah Lions sure is a bit worse than maybe the one you might play in uh, in Vince Cube, but they're kind of pretty similar, you know, right? And they all do the same job. And even at two, you know, there's some good two drop options at, at Peasant and whatnot. Um, that gets less true at four. And in the really powerful cubes, this is where a ton of mono white's power comes from. Actually, it has some absolutely disgusting four drops. Um, and they can run away with games so quickly. Um, so you look at, yeah, Pink Palace Jailer, we discussed best monarchy creature because it removes their things, but it helps you keep the monarchy, gives you that engine. It doesn't matter if they kill it, you still keep the monarchy, their thing doesn't come back. And um, if you flicker it, it's out flickering it, it gets great. Um, Seasons Engineer, obviously, another initiative creature, Bear Busted, we discussed why. Parallax Wave, I think, is probably, I think this is probably still true, but it's like maybe the most underrated card in Cube. Yeah, um, I from the moment I put it, back in mine about like three months ago i've just been i've never draft I, I i've never had the point where i've been able to draft it but every time i played against it it's just miserable <laughs> it's really yeah it's, good. Just, it's really <laughs> unbeatable like the um it gives you so much flexibility as well like the fact you, you can flicker your own you can exile your own things so you know often it, it's like you get their two blockers out of the way and they're like oh, okay well i'll uh i'll laugh your board or something and like, okay well get my stuff out and they all come back and now I'm ahead again because I've been tricked my ETBs like and that and yeah and then obviously you have the use case of ah oh, you have a good board I have a bar- good board I play a parallax wave I kill your board you're dead um you can also do some shenanigans with it with like containment priest or um if you have a way to flicker it at instant speed you can um like put all the triggers on the stack and then flick flicker it in response to a trigger and then they never get their stuff back you can you can do some stuff with uh, Displacer Kitten, but that's probably a different deck. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Parallax Waves busted. And then even stuff like um, Sarah Paragon's another card I've been really impressed by. Um, just gives you a ton of value. Nice if you have um, lands that you sack, like Wasteland Strip Mine stuff, because you can play it on turn five, play a land right away. You've got your value. You gain two life when you sack the land. And then if they don't kill the Paragon, you're just recasting everything they've killed in the previous four turns of the game, and they're going to be in a lot of trouble. Um, yeah, like Hero of Blade Hold, pretty solid one, like probably worse than the others we've talked about. But um, yeah, Gideon, 
solid card. Wandering Emperor, really, really strong. Um, both uh, as a flash thing to ki- kill their attacking creatures, or as just like a big combat trick that leaves a creature behind, you know? Um, yeah, they, you have a ton of great options at four. Like, as you say, you don't want a bunch of them, um, but like three, you, you want like three, uh, but the um, but you have such good options. It means that the like, the more fillery ones are not really high picks because you're kind of hoping for better and you don't want a ton, but um, you do definitely want some of these and there are some really good ones. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. The fours are kind of where it gets very scary. Um, five and more, we're not really running many, are we? Kind of, I've, um, what do we have? Kind of like, we might run a solitude, I'm assuming, but we're not paying mana for it, are we? Things must be going bad for us to pay mana for a solitude. I mean, you know, as we've talked about playing long games, solitude is great in a long game. You will get to five sometimes and pay mana for it. But I mean, certainly it's primary yeah, it's a nice, use cases yeah. to pitch. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's um, a nice alternate casting cost, despite it being the main casting cost of the card. Yeah. Yeah. And another nice thing to go with our Blink stuff, which can be a really nice sort of sub theme you can have in your white aggro deck. Um, like Ephemerate Solitude, particularly, is completely busted. Um, but yeah, Solitude is a great one. Um, the other one I'd call out, not a mono white card, but you should <laughs> absolutely always flash it. It's for failing us. Um, Another card I'm cutting from my cube because it's too good. <laughs> it's yeah, too bloody yeah. good. <laughs> Take cards Daniel is cutting for power level reasons is, is the, the advice. Um, yeah, uh, I'd almost try and splash this with zero fixing. Like, it's that good. Um, and... You know, you get to a late game and it will just win when you draw it, but it's also really nice in the developing stages of a game because you'll be on board, you can just take the monarchy and keep it. Um, there's no bad things to say about this card. If you can conceivably create a red mana at any stage of the game, you should put it in your deck. Yeah, I've seen plenty of people, including you, James, be in completely different colours and just, oh, I can splash Boris in my blue-black deck, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely um the other nice five actually that is sometimes worth playing especially if you have a bunch of the acceleration like the you know like an ancient tomb or or some moxon if we're in a moxon type cube is um guardian scale lord this mm-hmm. is the um fauna white three four flyer with backup one and when it or obviously the creature backs up onto attacks you can return something with mana cost less less than or equal to its power from your graveyard to the battlefield. Um, this just like you play it, you jump one of your creatures, it now has an attack, and it rebuys like a free top immediately, and that's so much value the turn you play it. And then if they don't answer it, it's gonna keep accruing that value. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, the uh, G- Guardian Scale Lord returning Parallax Wave is is a Boom. player I've made more than a few times, and it is Boom, phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fair. I kind of like, there's two last ones that I kind of want to touch on, which are in theory both in theory ones are five, ones are six drop, but you're they have options to not pay them for that. So try this one, Catherine. I've been quite impressed by. It's one of the Warhammer cards. It's five mana for a five five with Life Link. Um, then when it dies, you can put it exile it and put it in the, in the top six cards of your library. But it importantly has miracle for one or white, so this can be a two drop. Um, I know in theory this or, or this will get better if you are supporting miracles and have ways of manipulating them at the top of your library, which I'm not normally doing in just a normal mono white deck. But if you're lacking top end beef, this is quite good to to kind of luck into on turn two or three, and then. The other one as well, I, I quite like is Steel Seraph. So this is the prototype uh, prototype one, uh, Angel. Six generic for a 5-4 with flying, and then at the beginning of combat on your turn, it can either jump a creature you control, give it vigilance, or lifelink into them, into them. But it also has prototype for one white-white, and it comes in as a 3-3. Three, three. So this is also a 3-drop that can jump a creature of yours. Just helps you push this through the damage. And then, yeah, yeah, if you do end up in the late game, you can cast it as a 5-4 for 6-mana. It's like a big... Big Flying Angel. I've quite liked those ones. Um, the prototypes have been a bit risky at certain points because if your opponent copies them, they get the full-size one, which can not all, which doesn't always work out great, but they have been fun. I will not deny that. I have enjoyed playing with them, even if they have backfired a couple of times. Yeah, no, I think the Seraph's really strong, actually. Like, just, uh, you know, you jump your Adeline and all of a sudden it has an attack and, uh, you know, their their board of blockers that looked intimidating is all of a sudden not an issue. Um, yeah, I think that card's quite strong. Um, 
can be annoying if they um you know sometimes you're in a spot where you just have no like no other artifacts in your deck and then all of a sudden their like Rex Age or whatever is good against you. Yeah, um, that's fair. But yeah, I think in, in general the card's really strong and I don't think that's a reason, you know, not to play it by any means. No, definitely. Kind of, but um, while we're still talking about the curve and stuff, there is a kind of a chunk of creatures that we haven't really mentioned in our one, two, three, and four drops, and that's kind of like uh, creatures that kind of I kind of associate a bit more with like death and taxi style of cards. So kind of we touched on them a, a bit with Thalia, Garden of Thraben, but cards kind of cards that kind of are good white aggressive cards, but also just kind of really annoying. I'm thinking of cards like Lion Sash and like. Archon of Emeria or like Elite Spellbinder. Um, what do you think of those cards, James? Kind of like how it, it, it kind of harkens back to something we, we touched on right at the start in terms of like uh, power over utility and abilities. Kind of like like with those cards that are kind of annoying for your opponents to kind of play around. How important are those in a mono white deck? And kind of is that kind of like a a different way you can mess with your opponents? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, those cards can be really strong. Um, yeah, obviously, it, it's a combination of how annoying are they and how much do they contribute to your get them dead plan. Um, so, like, at least Spellbinder, I actually really like. Probably should have talked about that at the free drop slot. It's, um, yeah, just a really nice combination, of, especially in higher power level cubes, actually, because your opponent's game cans are often, like, quite linear. They really hinge on one card, you know, and you... You take Fest Reef or you take their Fractured Identity in the control deck. Or, you know, in a combo deck, you you take their Necromancy and all of a sudden they can't reanimate until turn five. And that's probably enough time for you either to kill them or attack their mana and stop from getting there or just get so far ahead for what whatever they reanimate isn't gonna isn't gonna turn the corner for them. Um yeah, like that card can be very strong. Archon of Amiria, I have found to be I think it's fine. Certainly there can be games where it's great, but it's also kind of games where your opponent's just playing one spell a turn anyway, and it's just, like, it's fine, but it's lower impact on the board than your other three drops, right? You're you're only putting two power into play in that. In the games where the ability doesn't end up mattering, it, it feels quite underpowered, you know? In a way where, like, the... the um, where's the um, Elite Spellbinder is, like, kind of always get something unless it's really late and is free power instead of two. No, yeah, I think that's fair. And also kind of, I'm assuming those cards also get better in high power level environments where they're stopping your opponents doing the... But basically, you're stopping your opponent doing their broken thing uh, while you're curving out and chipping away at their life damage. Kind of something, yeah, something like the elite spellbinder taking a key combo card out of their hand or, or just delaying it, that, it, laying it that turn or two for you to kill them, I'm assuming can be quite important um yeah for sure and and the other things so i'd say in the higher power level environments the importance of sideboard cards for linear decks goes up oh that's right yeah and like archon is phenomenal against a storm deck and um and the other card you mentioned was line slash really nice to have that main deck bit of interaction with your opponent's graveyard and obviously you know if you end up not main decking it phenomenal out of the sideboard against reanimator yeah and then kind of Lastly, kind of while we're talking about curve, before we kind of move on into some of the other things I want to talk about, um, how do you feel about a card like Selfless Spirits? I've, I actually think this card is really strong. So Selfless Spirit is one, a white for two, one with flying. that You can sacrifice it to give your creatures indestructible until in a turn. There are other cards that do similar things. Um, in white, you have some cards like Dauntless Bodyguard. Basically annoying creatures that kind of are fine bodies aggressively but can also protect either a key, one key creature or protect your whole board i have personally found these to be really infuriating to play against kind of like i guess they're kind of similar to the mother of rune style of effect in terms of they can protect your board but kind of they're just a bit more depth and also more aggressive than mother of rune it's kind of like do you like do you value these cards a lot or kind of like uh, like in terms of pick order kind of how are you ranking them yeah self spirit i like i think it's one of the better two drops um because it has it does all that annoying stuff against the interactive decks, right? While still being at least a reasonable amount of pressure. Um, because the thing you don't want to do is like overload on those cards, and then you play against someone who's just going bigger than you, and you've not killed them quickly enough, and not really interacted with them enough, and all you're doing is protecting your things, but your things aren't killing them 
but quicker than they're killing you. Um, but yeah, self spirit I like because it is two power in the air at least, and against the interactive people is great. You know, you um you play your big impactful four drop, and your self spirit can help defend it. Um, and obviously great against sweepers. Um, the stuff like benevolent bodyguard is i think it's like playable in mono white um i think in lower power level one so i think it's, it's yeah in, it's in lower power level it's, yeah. it's very yeah, yeah. very hard i think yeah like the higher power level stuff i don't love it in mono white just because it's only a one one um i do think it is phenomenal with with lower sphere if you end up doing that um i don't know if bodyguards are two one oh sorry i was thinking of benevolent bodyguard oh uh, um, yes yeah yeah that's, yeah yeah that's a Similar effect, but that can target any creature. Give it protection. Dauntless Bodyguard is the one you see more in like Peasant's Cube. In Peasant Cube, which yeah. is the one mana two one. Just oh yeah, no, I think that one's solid. Um, yeah, like perfectly fine one drop. Um, I'd say like a bit worse than Usher, but like you know certainly better than your um, Savannah Lions of the World. Oh, it's... James, <laughs> sorry, sorry. But, but, no, no, yeah, that one makes sense. And kind of just moving on to like. So, so that's kind of an overview of kind of like some of the cards that go into the archetype at, at different points in the curve. Kind of just rounding this off, kind of like roughly, and you don't have to do the math on this, but how like roughly how many of each kind of mana value are we looking to kind of put together? Kind of we'll move on to the draft in a minute, but kind of like when you are putting your deck together and when you're building it, kind of like wh- where where does the U in the curve? Is it kind of is it two drops? Is it kind of like is it like a spattering of like a smattering of one drops, bulk two drops? three or four three drops and then like one or two four drops is that kind of where we are or kind of how we when you're putting together a mono white deck, kind of like what is your optimal curve look like um i think like twos and threes of where, where you want the most um obviously you know if you've got a bunch of ones in there you know like mother of runes giver of runes figure of destiny swords of plowshares path to exile i'm not i'm not like oh no i have too many one drops so that's never really a thing but um Generally, I'm sort of ha- having, I guess, the peak of that curve of that, between two and three. Um, it partly depends that split on if you have stuff like Ancient Tomb, if you have stuff like Chrome Mox. Um, White Weenie probably makes better use of those cards than any other deck, and that can allow you to play a few more of the um, really high impact you know, threes and fours over a couple of twos because some amount of the time you're going to have free mana on turn two. Um, I guess the, the sort of opposite of that is if you have a bunch of wasteland strip mine stuff, which is also very good in mono white, but that pushes you to have a lower curve because sometimes you will use your f- second or third land drop to kill one of their lands and you want to play another cheap card for turn you do that. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, strip mine. So, strip mine, wasteland are, are very. I found to be very good in this type of archetype. Kind of, actually, while we're touching about them, kind of, what other utility lands do you think that they can run? Kind of like, like, like. Yeah, yeah. We mentioned ancient tomb. We mentioned kind of fast mana on lands, but kind of wasteland strip. I'm assuming Urza Saga is going to be good in this. Just kind of getting like it'll put it'll put a creature on the board and also go and get like some equipment to stick on our creatures. Um, what else are we looking at in terms of utility lands, James? Yeah, um, yeah, Saga's great, absolutely. I'd play it with one target basically every time. Um, probably wouldn't play it with zero, but I'd play it with one every time. Um, the Outside of that, I think City of Traitors is the one we haven't mentioned. Basically think about it as a worse ancient tomb, but it's still great. Um, beyond that, a lot of this depends on whether you end up actual mono white or whether you're splashing. Uh, I think we're right, going to okay. discuss splashing a bit later, but um, I think a lot of these decks you do end up splashing, so there's a lot of really great cards to splash for that work really well. Um, one of the upsides, if you aren't, is you get to play more of these colorless utility lands. Um, and at that point, you can start looking at things like Mutavolt, um, Mishra's Factory, the creature lands are all really great in mono white because... You know, all those games where you've got some early damage in, your opponent's stabilized a bit, you've traded a bunch of resources, you've cast your removal spells, you know, you've pathed, you've sourced plowshares, you've cast your reprieve, everyone's a bit low on resources, and then you're just going to kill them with a Mishra's Factory, and that's great. Um, but yeah, but again, not not something you're probably going to be able to do if they're all monocolored. And just be careful of um, when you're adding a bunch of colorless lands to your deck if you have a bunch of double white, like especially on turn two. Um, this is, I think, why 
stuff like um, the Onin Relic Warder, the like white white two two that kept, that gets rid of one of the artifacts for enchantments is like gone down a little bit just because a bunch of great utility lands and there's a bunch of great reasons to splash. So having white white on two can be a little bit tough, you know. Oh yeah, I actually brought in Leonin Relic Warden, Warden or Warder into my cube as a way of powering down Mono White because yeah. it's harder to cast. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I do see, I, I do see that. Yeah, the the land aspect of things. Just just on the topic of lands, how many lands do we want to play in this aggressive deck? Like, I'm assuming it's sixteen or less. But um, how are you seeing it, James? Depends. Sometimes, honestly, I've sometimes you're on seventeen. Um, I would. Count like wasteland strip mine stuff as like only half land, half spell really to start off with. Um I'd say you'll maybe your default is sixteen. Um, you know, obviously you're counting like your chrome mocks and whatever as a land here. Um it depends how many fours you have. If you just like get four amazing four drops and you want to play them all, then you can play a bit more. Um if your curve happens to be very lean, you can play a bit less. Um but honestly, I'm very rarely on 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 15 at this point um i think this is where utility lands help as well right you just get to play more lands and be okay with it because some of your lands do things and that makes sense and also i'm assuming if you're splashing then you're you're, you're not going down in lands like if you're splashing for your fourth air lingus you're probably 17 just so you have enough red sources to find is, is that right yeah i mean it, it, you know it depends on how many jewels you have but playing one more land is certainly a way to make your mana a bit easier right yeah um so let's move on to the draft now so we so we have our base we know roughly what the deck does we know what what some of the cards do we know what we're aiming for um how do we get into mono white and 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 the way i'm phrasing this is is we're not forcing mono white we are sitting down what cards are we going to be seeing to let us know that mono white is open and good for us to move into kind of what are the what are the signposts of that james so i think the not a ton of cards that you're gonna like be taking pack one pick one and being like i really really want to be mono white if i possibly can mm-hmm. be um there are a couple like the initiative creatures i think push you in that direction if they're in your cube um parallax wave is probably at its best in mono white basically great in every white deck um and that's basic that's kind of a lot of the drafts you end up in mono white you'll start off with the, like one of these really busted white cards, like Parallax Waver, Palace Jailer, something like that, or like a Sword of Plowshares is kind of a perfect example. Like phenomenal in every white deck, and often you'll splash it because it's so efficient. Um, like a Path to Exile or a Thieve or something. You know, one of these interactive cards that you'd also love to have in your blue white control deck or your five color deck. Um, and if you end up taking a few white cards out of the first couple of packs and Generally, at this point in the draft, it depends on your preferences a bit. I'm not generally like taking the aggressive creatures super early here, you know, outside of obviously the busted ones. I'm not looking to like second pick a Luminarch Aspirant particularly. Um, what I am looking to do is the, when you start seeing those aggressive creatures come back round, you know, when it's like pick eight and you notice uh, like the, um, the seasoned Hallow Blade from pack one is still there. Um, it's not. That season Palo Blade is so good that um, you'll want to chuck away your um, your blue cards you drafted midway through that pack and be like, right, I'm on a white now. <laughs> it is the fact that everyone else at the table has seen season Palo Blade and not yeah. taken it can start to give you a good inkling that mono white might be where you're meant to be. And if you get a couple more white of the uh, like aggressive creatures coming back around, you're just like, right, okay, this is now my lane because. I know I have it all to myself. That's, I think, a lot of the difference between when mono white de- when white aggro decks play very well and they don't is how much you have to fight for those cheap creatures. Mm-hmm. Because if you have to fight for cheap creatures, it means sometimes you can't use your early picks on other cards. You know, whereas if you know it's yourself, you know, often you'll see, say, a Falio, which you really want um, early in pack two, and you're like, right, well, that's the card I want the most. But that's going to wheel. I'm going to take this reprieve. Or I'm going to take this land that's going to help me splash some stupid free drop. Like, oh, I'm going to take this Chrome Mox that's just going to accelerate my deck a ton. Because even though those cards are maybe not as important to my deck as Falia, I know I'm like 80, 90% wheel that Falia, and those other cards won't. 
and that, so you just get to take two cards out of every pack in your in your early packs. It feels like, and that's that's a really great place to be. Yeah, that's that combined with. I guess just the nature of a mono white deck or a aggressive deck in, in, in terms of like you when you are mono colored and when you're just splashing for one card because nowadays kind of splashing is relatively free um just not having to use as many picks on like things like land or fixing you know you can curve out um if you want to it's because you have a reason to you don't need to to make your deck work if that makes sense kind of like a, a lot of other decks in cube are over two colors you need to draw fix like most drafters are drafting facing the fact that the, these kind of aggressive decks can kind of almost free roll a bunch of cards or like, like a bunch of picks kind of like yeah as you mentioned take take two cards out of, out of every pack you just end up with so many more options and, and kind of one of the things you mentioned earlier about like sideboard cards and like that is something that kind of you do get as a byproduct of just having all these additional picks or kind of additional cards just for you if you're in this open seat because you can build the best version of your deck for game one and then if your opponent shows you something you can adjust it in game two and you have those cards and that's something that is quite strong with mono white i found yeah 100 percent. i think um we can talk about matchups a bit later but um something like a contained priest or a relic of gentis a really strong card for a reanimator matchup is very often something that you should be taking over a card that you will main deck yeah because you will find another card for that main deck slot and you might wheel it and but that sideboard card's gonna be huge impact for that that matchup. No, oh, definitely. And yeah, it's especially in higher power level cubes, I think. Kind of just the fact that I'm not saying people get into their lanes, but kind of like in in packs two or three when people know what they are. Like once you're the only mono white drafter at the table, like other people can be in white, but it doesn't mean they're necessarily gonna be looking at your cards or cards you could take anywhere near as highly as ones that they want. Kind of like again, because they have to pick lands, so they have to pick fixing, they're not gonna be able to take a sideboard card that early in their picks, which kind of which you get yeah for sure and you should be aware when you're looking at the packs which of these cards do other people want and which of these cards do only i want every everyone who's touching white wants reprieve only you want season tallow blade you know season tallow blade for some reason in my mind is now the epitome <laughs> of filler, the filler white creature oh, yeah. no, yes, <laughs> cool cool so let's uh mo- let's keep it rolling let's talk about splashing so there's a lot of very busted cards that touch on white. We've mentioned fourth Aelingus that is effectively pack one, pick one and then you work out the rest of it over the course of a, over the course of the draft. Um, how do you go about splashing James in in an aggro deck? Because this is definitely something. Because this is definitely something like two years ago that kind of like ev- everyone everyone agreed that mono red was good, mono white was good, Boris was trash. That does not feel the case anymore. And I, I don't think it's just fourth ailing is being printed. I think it's a couple of other but a couple of other things that have that have happened, but kind of like what has changed in terms of splashing specifically in our aggro decks and kind of how are we looking to splash specifically in uh white aggro? Yeah, I think a lot of what's changed there's just like a bunch more um single pip cards that are worth splashing for that complement your guess aggressive game plan really, really well. Um the mana's also got a little bit better. We have more jewels, um, more untapped jewels in a lot of cubes now. Um, and honestly, you should kind of be speculating on those um, at certain points over like stuff that is like might be a 23rd card in your deck, but might be a, not make it, you know? Just even if you don't have the splash card yet, just take the inspiring advantage, you know? If there's a decent chance you'll see something you want to splash in, in red particularly. Um I think red is the most common color you splash um, in in the really high power level cubes. There's um, a bunch of red cards that go great into mono white um, or white aggro. Um, Four failings, obviously, we've talked about is ridiculous, but um, Afari is also insane at the top of your curve. Just um, a big hasty threat. If they don't kill it right away, it's just racking up those experience counts. It's not going to be beatable for them. You're gaining the life. Um, even if they do have a removal spell, if it goes to your graveyard and they seem to be able to just tap a rebel and get it back, that's great. Um, but also, you can splash freeze. It doesn't have to be the expensive cards. And they're a great freeze, and they're freeze that will still be great later in the game in, in red. Um, and I mean, so, you, you know, obviously you hope to have the red source on turn three, but the card doesn't suck if you don't. Um, so here I'm talking about things like uh, Broadside Bombardiers is certainly the best. That card's absolutely absurd. Um, just to note when playing Broadside Bombardiers, check if they're dead. 
Because you'll be surprised how often they're dead, you know. Uh, they quite often see people, they'll just be like, oh, broadside bombardiers, like, throw my clue at your blocker or whatever. Um, and it's like, yeah, but you could have just, like, got a bit of damage in, sacked your Gideon, cack your Gideon and kill me, you know, like, that deal six on its own. Yeah, um, if only you can do it after it's dealt damage. Yeah, after it's dealt damage, you can do it. Post combat, you can do it whenever you, any time after you have attacked. Um, and the menace makes it really hard to block. Um, you can get blockers out of the way. And it's the cards have said. Um, but also stuff like gut, true soul zealot is goes great in mono white. Um, you have a lot of these like little trinkety, um, you know, clues, one one tokens lying around from a lot of your other cards. Um, and just turning those into full one menace that are already attacking. Um, your opponent's going to die real quick. Uh, um, uh, Lelia is obviously great. Um, Snowball super quick. Um, best on turn three, but will continue to be good later in the game. Later in the game, you know, you're sure they're more likely to be able to block it, but you're also more likely to hit stuff off the top of your deck that you can cast even the turn you play it. So, um, yeah, I, all, all of these cards are really strong splashes. Um the one that I think merits a bit more consideration, I see people splash Ragavan quite a lot. Um, obviously, the card's really powerful, but it is really powerful if you cast it on turn one. Um, yeah, once they have a blocker, it doesn't do as much. It really doesn't. Um, it does. Like, not that you can't, you know, if you have a white start, you can take a Ragavan by all means. But at that point, you are aiming to be Boros. You're not aiming to be like white splash just Ragavan or like two red cards. Um, and at that point, you're going to need a lot of dual lands. Uh, you can get there. It's worth speculating on and, and trying. But um, but just be wary. Like, don't put Boros and don't put Ragavan into your deck with like six red sources. You know, it's not worth it. No, I think that's fair. And then another combination that seems better. I always think this must be really strong. Kind of just, just have a really aggressive deck and splash a time walk. But talk to me about. Uh, blue white <laughs> james <laughs> how do, how do you find those as a combination yeah no it, it can be really strong um like time walk and ancestral are both really obviously really good splashes and power cube but I'm sure that will be very surprising to everyone listening um but um outside of that there's a bunch of good blue cards that will add a lot to your uh white aggressive deck um counter spells play really nice with leave cheap aggressive creatures you just get ahead on board, counter their play, and you, you don't need to do that very many times. They're just going to be too far behind, you know? Anytime you get to trade up on mana in that way is going to be really strong. Um, the other blue cards tend to be in the... They're not really worth splashing on their own, you know? Um, I'm not going to be like, I've got this mono-white deck, but I'm splashing this Remand. Remand's a really good card for my deck, but... That's not worth playing some playing some islands for. Um, but one place I think you do end up quite a lot is um, especially if you start blue. Um, the way I draft, I start to blue probably too often. But um, or you just like you see some good blue cards early because there are a bunch of really strong blue cards, right? Um, and then blue kind of dries up, and you end up taking some white cards. Um, having that little package of like four to six strong blue cards in your otherwise white aggressive deck can work really nicely um and yeah so the counters play great but obviously you want to prioritize the ones that are only a single blue pip but um to fairy three mana to fairy is really nice um a little tempo play to get their blocker out of the way it draws you a card and just randomly hoses their counter spells um and stuff like you know you can go up to like fractured identity that that can certainly be a powerful card for for this sort of deck so the other point that's a five drop james does that does, does that like it's a very powerful card but does that still work or, or kind of uh, if you are going blue are, are, are you pushing your curve slightly higher than you would if you were just more straight monocolored yeah i mean the blue white decks very much exist on a spectrum you know um <laughs> okay so you can be almost mono white splashing a couple of blue counter spells in which case yeah maybe you don't want fractured identity right like i'm not putting fractured identity in the glorified savannah lines in the same deck very often but um you what well, can certainly be but you can be you know like i have like 
13 to 14 creatures that are pretty impactful. Like, I've got my couple of good, I've got like a Luminarch Aspirin into a Blade Splicer, and now I have a Count Spell up, right? Um, and the, um, these decks really help well if you can have some of your spec threats that work at instant speed. Um, I think Restoration Angel isn't one we touched on much earlier, but um, that goes really nicely if you're playing counter spells. Um, because obviously you can hold the mana up, and if they don't counter your thing, you can play your resto, flick your guy, whatever you want to do. Um, but yeah, the, the blue white decks aren't they can be aggressive, they don't have to be aggressive. And obviously, you know, there's the other end of the spectrum where you're playing no win conditions and so... <laughs> varying and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> have seven counters and you're having a great time and no one else is resolving spells. Uh, but that's very much a different deck. <laughs> no, that makes sense. I think. We'll, we'll touch briefly on the other com- color combinations, but I, I think it's worth pointing out kind of white, red have, because of the cards we've mentioned, go together quite well in a lot of cubes. Same with white, blue. It's kind of, it's the best white cards with the best blue cards just tend to work. That isn't really as true with white, black, and white, green. Like there are combinations of them that kind of work, like, but it is more you're putting these things in your cube for things to people to draft rather than they just work naturally, if that kind of makes sense. Kind of like white black can be kind of death and taxes y or aristocrat y if you're kind of going wide with your tokens, that kind of thing in white. And then white green kind of is the worst color combination in cube. But kind of like I I have found some joy with kind of like white green just like more power than mana. That's a mm. fine combination. And also there is definitely something there with like plus one, one counters, like we mentioned, um what was it, like Lion Sash and Luminarch Aspirant, those kind of go well with some of the green cards that put counters on stuff. But kind of you're kind of at, at that point you're not really being a white ex- aggressive deck. You're kind of you're doing a whole other separate archetype, just using some of the cards with white or from white. Yeah, I've, yeah I think that's very much the thing. I think White green, I'm actually not as low on that as you by the sounds of it. I think there kind of is something there, but it's it's very much not I am splashing green in my white deck because a lot of what I want from green is the elves. I want to go like elf into free drop into palace jailer or parallax yeah. wave or something and kill them that way. Um I think I, I think uh, I think Arwen is a very nice addition for that deck as well. Um I think we might finally have a good Selesnia gold card. Um but yeah, I think it's very much a different deck. I'm very rarely going to be like splashing a couple of green cards in my mono white deck. Um, similar with black white, I think um, a lot of about what's good for black is giving you is the disruptive elements like the, the hand attack, and you really want to be able to play those early. So it, it, it's not again like I'm splashing a few black cards into my white deck. It's I am very much white black. Um, I guess the one exception is you could see splashing a. Orcish Bowmasters um, in the right spot. Yeah. Because that card's messed up. But um, yeah, I think that's that's really the only black card I can think of I'm actively looking to splash. What about a Bob? What about a Dark Confidant? Would you, or is that just kind of not worth the splash? Is that too, like, 2014 or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't hate it. I mean, li- li- listen, it's better than it's better than most of your white two drops would be in a white aggro deck. Like, it's kind of a great home for it, right? You don't. Um, you don't care about the damage very much because you're the aggressor. Um, but am I actually like looking to stretch my mana that m- to cast Bob? I'm not sure. Because you do want it kind of early, ideally, right? Yeah. Also, worth pointing out, it was pre- I think it was printed in 2007, so I was wildly off there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a few years. <laughs> no, good, good. No, it makes sense. So um, how late can you go into Mono White? Kind of like, do you think you, if you're seeing them end of pack one, but you haven't committed yet, is, is pack two too late? Or do you think you can still pull a, de- pull a deck together out of two packs? Pack two, if you have like no white cards, start of pack two is a bit rough. Um, and at that point, it's like, can you play these white card, good white cards you're seeing with some of the good cards you already have, you yeah. know? You don't necessarily need to go down this very, very aggressive white focused route. Um, but one thing that does I find happen quite a lot is that, like, I know I'm drafting some like cool artifact deck or like greed vamp deck or like a reanimator deck or a five color deck or whatever. And then it's like, I get my wheel pack back and it's like, oh, yeah, there's, no, there's nothing for my deck here. Fine, I'll 
take the sleep mark aspen or whatever i'll put that in the sideboard yeah i'll take play play so i'll put that in the <laughs> sideboard yeah okay i'll, I'll i suppose i'll take uh i'll, I'll take this mother of runes because sometimes that wheels because people are mad and i'm like yeah the sideboard too yeah. and then you uh, you know you open up your pack too and you're like oh Perfect. That kind of is a parallax wave there. I should probably be doing that, shouldn't I? <laughs> um, because, you know, you're just like, well, white's obviously really open. And yeah, you can pivot into it. Um, so, And I think that is something worth bearing in mind in, in Cube in general. Like, you don't have to be like, I'm in this color. I'm going to take the card in this color, even though I'm like almost never going to play it. Like, just, just spec on the white card and see what happens, you know? You, even if you don't really want to go down that route, sometimes that will be a route that presents itself to you. Yeah, think of the upside, I guess, is the way of thinking about it. Um, right, so at that point, we kind of, we've got the deck, we've drafted it, we know what it wants to be. Now we're playing the games, James. Kind of, what are our matchups like? What are we looking forward to playing and what are we looking to avoid uh, in a draft pod? Sure, so I, th- I think we're, we're good against... Most of the reactive decks, because our cards are just pretty high impact, you know, on their own. Um, I think this is where white aggro has a lot of an edge over stuff like red aggro, actually, because with red, it feels like if they stop you getting in a bunch of early damage, um, they kill your chief creatures, then you're just looking at your burn spells and they kind of don't matter because the reach isn't relevant because they're at 17. Um, Whereas with white, it's just like all our cards matter, you know, we're mostly have strong cards up and down the curve like your smuggler's copter and your luminar aspen like they still need to kill them on like turn five if they're not killing you you know um so i found we have good matchups there and that's where our um taxing stuff can be really nice as well um fast combo and we have really good tools against storm um the animator can be tough certainly um it's hard for any of these matchups to be like truly bad, bad because we're just really good at punishing any like not great draw. Like even a really good reanimated deck is some sometimes has a suboptimal draw, and you punish them better than almost every other deck. But um, it is probably true that like the, a good white draw loses to a good reanimated draw a lot of the time. Um, I think yeah, that's why it's really important to prioritize sideboard cards for this matchup. Like one containment priest or um, or um, Relic of Gentus goes a really long way here. Yeah, no, definitely, because that, that thing is a lot of your removal is based on once it's already on the board, but if they get their value out of their Archon of Cruelty, or if they just draw seven cards off Grizzlebrand, they've kind of they're kind of ready to go again. Like, like, like they can whiff off those, but yeah, it's kind of like the horse is already bolted by the time that you're pathing the Grizzlebrand, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um... Gristlebrand, I think, is actually a lot more attackable than some of the other ones, just because um, sometimes, you know, they put a Gristlebrand into play, and then you kill it, and on, a, on turn two, that's generally going to be, like, good enough for them. But if they end up doing it on turn three or four, sometimes you're far enough ahead that they can't pay seven life and not be dead. Yeah, um, yeah especially if they've, like, used actual factual reanimate and paid a bunch of life as well. So, yeah, 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 yeah. that is very true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, once they've archoned you, you're in a lot of trouble. Um, even stuff, you know, decks like Flash and things that really punish you here as well, right? Where they're just like Flash World Spine Worm, look at three five fives. Your mono white deck really can't do a lot about that most of the time, barring like Parallax Wave or something. Yeah. Um, how scared of decks with board wipes are you? Kind of like just good, like, so, 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 so again, this is something that kind of, it's, Again, a few years ago, wasn't like mid-range decks weren't really a thing in Powered Cube a few years ago. But just because of cards getting better, you can be a deck that's just like good mid-rangey creatures and spells now, even in higher power kind of like How is White Aggro against kind of just like a Golgari or a Jund mid-rangey deck that's got like slightly bigger creatures, got removal, that kind of stuff? Like, and 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 also the the aforementioned board wipes, kind of like how. How afraid of them are you, and how sh- much should you be p- playing around board wipes? I'm, if I have a deck version of this deck I'm really happy with, I'm generally not scared of board wipes. Um, because, I mean, obviously, like, they can be good in the right draw, where, you know, you go two drop, three drop, make it a board wipe. But, like, if we look at the falls, for example, um, that we talked about here, like, if you play Season of Judea, Palace, Jailer, blah, 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 you don't care if they board wiped, you still have the monarchy, you still have the initiative, they're still yeah. in a lot of trouble. 
um, if you played Parallax Wave, you can blink your creatures and your creatures don't die and only bad creatures die. Um, the, um, we have a bunch, we have good planeswalkers, obviously great against board wipes. We even have like good equipment, you know, you, um, my board wipe and kill like three of your creatures, but you have a Jetta with a bunch of counters still in play, and then you just like play another creature. And that's a huge threat all over again. Um, I mean, I'm not saying like they can't be good. Like they, they can be good, and you know, if you're you should board in board wipes against by aggro, but um, they're not like game over for the deck by any means. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. But the one other matchup that does kind of concern me is ironically a matchup we've a deck we've kind of trashed a little bit in the past. But I think this <laughs> is kind of its only good matchup. Mono black aggro. No, sorry. <laughs> Big mono green. Big mono green is kind of scary for mono white because they just go. They go bigger than you do, faster than you do. And like, unless you can kill the elves kind of on site, it's, um, you know, you're not very good against like their seven and eight drops, you know. Um, and, you know, you don't have discard, you don't have counter spells. Um, it can be kind of tough if, they, you know, when they have a draw where they're like turn one elf, turn two elf, elf. I'm not feeling good about that game, actually. Um, it's why, and this is quite counterintuitive. Um, if I get an opportunity to pick one up kind of for free in the draft, I quite like having a Wrath in the sideboard. Okay. Um, I know it sounds odd because you're a creature deck, but um, you recover way better than they do from a Wrath because they don't have any mana and can't cast their impactful spells, and you can still cast your impactful spells. Um, and you have stuff like Selfless Spirit is a really nice combo with Wrath of God. Um, and you just play Planeswalker and then Wrath. Um, and it tends to really stop those green decks uh, in their tracks. Yeah, I, I, if I play against green, I have a wrath in my opening hand. I'm feeling quite good about the game. Um, like kind of a niche one, and it's only for you know, it's kind of only for the really big mana green decks, right? It's not for the like elf into aggressive free drop green decks as much into like a planeswalker. But um, it, I mean, it is worth bearing in mind for that matchup because I think it's it's an angle for people don't tend to take because it sounds weird to have put vafs in your aggressive deck. No, 100%. 100%. Yeah, I, I would not have thought of that. And, and actually, my question beforehand was, how scared are you of vafs? I guess, yeah, if you are the one with the power, then you can control when and if you do it and if you even sideboard it in. That makes sense. Kind of rounding off the conversation on matchups, kind of, I have a question for you, James. So kind of, Mono White does have a bit of a reputation of kind of like, if you want to win a cube, if you want a three-hour cube, um, you draft Mono White. I don't personally think White Aggro is the strongest deck in all of cube, but I do think it's potentially the winningest deck. Do you agree with that? I kind of do, yeah. But I think for mainly the reason that I think it's... And this is obviously particular to your playgroup who you cube with. Um, I think this is certainly true if you're playing on Magic Online. I think it is the most underdrafted deck. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I think if you told me going into the draft that people will be, the same amount of people will be drafting blue as drafting white, I'd probably rather be drafting the blue deck. But um, that's not the case normally. And people love drafting blue. And part of this, right, is I totally get it and I do the same thing. If you, when you're sitting down to cube, you really want to do something sweet and for a lot of people like playing white aggro a whole bunch of times is maybe not it but um but it does just leave to you be able to get like a really pretty good version of this deck a lot of the time um like do i think that a um like the a really good version of mono white is better than a really good version of reanimator or a really good version of like a blue artifact deck not necessarily but i think you're going to be able to get a really good version of white aggro more often than you're going to be able to get a really good version of those decks um and after, I'm not saying like go out and force it, but yeah. if your tr goal is to win more of cubes, and most of those cubes, drafting white aggro more will help you. Um, just be open to it when you see those cards wheeling, be prepared to move in. Remember what aggressive cards were in your opening pack. If they come back, be ready, you know? Yeah, definitely. I think the willingness to be open to all archetypes is, is generally the way to go. And just the fact that, yeah, kind of when you're in Powered Cube, kind of like a lot of the cards that you list off that are in Powered Cube aren't really the ones in mono white decks. It's like, oh, you can shield it into Time Twister, all this kind of stuff. You can sneak attack and Emrakul, this kind of cool stuff. Um, yeah, you don't, people don't often say, I can cast a Thalia on turn two. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, for sure. But um, but I think it is borne out by the fact that if you look at the um place where people draft cube really competitively, like the Discord server, you don't really get the drafts where no one's in white and it's completely open. You know, um, people people prioritize those cards. No, that makes sense. So I think that's going to round off the conversation on specifically kind of like the deck drafting it, playing it, that kind of stuff. I do kind of want to touch a bit on kind of cube construction or kind of like cubes that you'll see mono white in. Because as I kind of mentioned earlier on in the recording, that kind of you just see mono white everywhere because yeah, it's like all rarities and also it's budget. So I'm I'm just going to going to stuff a bunch of cards for you now and kind of I think. 90% of these could go into in any white aggressive deck at any rarity. So so firstly, these are all common. So you have Benevolent Bodyguard, Novice Inspector, Thraven Inspector, Cathar Commando, Westfold Rider. Those are all commons. They're all pennies. At Uncommon, you have some really busted cards like Dawnless Bodyguard, Mother of Runes, Recruitment Officer, Usher of the Fallen, Odonto Vanguard, Samwise the Stoutheart, Flicker Wisp, Palace Jailer, Path to Exile, Swords to Plowshares. Those are all uncommons. That's kind of like the level you see at... Uh, peasant cube kind of like as as james mentioned earlier it does fall off a bit when you get to the four drops but they are downshifting stuff quite a lot all the time with like commander sets so honestly i had no idea that palace trailer was non common um i question if you should put it into your peasant cube <laughs> that but, seems fair. Um, it will certainly be very good if you do no, that seems fair and then but but then also important as well this next slot are all cards that are less than a dollar or a quid. So you have Isamario Hound of Condor for just some raw stats. You have Containment Priest, which is wild that that's now less than a quid. Luminarch Aspirant, Spellbook Vendor, Thalia Garden of Thraben, Blade Spicer, Elite Spellbinder, and probably the best white card, White Plume Adventurer. Those are all less than a pound or a dollar. And well, I've just listed off like 20 cards, and that is... A kind of scary mono white deck in a la- in a vast majority of cubes, and the fact that a quarter of them are common, over half are uncommon, and the rest are all less than a dollar is one of the reasons why it's just so prevalent in so many cubes. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, honestly, if you want to max out the um, the value, uh, the power level of your mono white deck, price is going to be an issue for very few cards. Um, looking through here like yeah Alex wave is a tenor is maybe the um more expensive ones sure some of the planeswalkers maybe you switch them to different planeswalkers or whatever um but there's very few expensive cards in this deck um even stuff like uh you know staff of a storyteller at uncommon is, is re- a really nice one uh, i just don't know if rarity is of any card that's rare <laughs> ignore me but it is only like a pound one pound fifty or something um, a couple of other bits I kind of wanted to ask you, James. Just kind of, just, just we are coming towards an end of a conversation. I kind of want to touch on how much mono white has changed over the last couple of years. Like we definitely like haven't mentioned Armageddon or Ravages of War so far today, but those used to be like mass land destruction used to be one of the tried and true ways of winning a game. Kind of like you, you go one drop, two drop, three drop, removal spell, destroy your lands, and you kind of win. Like. That doesn't seem as the fact we haven't spoken about them probably means that they're not where you want to be anymore. Is that fair? Yeah, I kind of feel like those cards have been a bit overrated for a while, honestly. Um, I don't know if I'm about to anger the internet here, but um, so here's the thing: right, you can absolutely have games where they play out exactly like that. You get ahead on board, destroy all the lands, you can convert from there really easily. Um, the thing is, your other four drops are also going to be great in that spot. They're also going to win you the game when you're far ahead. Um, but, what in, but when your opponent has removed your creatures or played their own threats for the better, you just literally can't cast your Ravagers of War. It does nothing. Um, because you cast it, you're locking yourself into losing to their better board. Um, and one of the upsides we said about one of the light is, yes, you can curve out and get those three wins, but you don't have to. You can play the really good mid range game, you know? Um, and the Ravager stuff doesn't really contribute to that at all. It's is to me, it is kind of win more at this point. Um, it's not to say like I think they're really quite good sideboard cards actually. Um, but obviously that's like kind of you don't want to put cards in your cube necessarily or a ton of them just to be sideboard cards. But against something like Storm, for example, um, Armageddon will be like one of your best cards because that is a matchup where you're basically always going to be ahead on board. Yeah, they are not playing a creature. Yeah. 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 Their plan has nothing to do with they will play no creatures. They might play a few removal spells, but they 
won't have so much interaction they're killing all of your stuff and then you're just going to armageddon and they need quite a lot of lands to go off so they can lose um and they're actually a spot where you know if you're winning by a bit on board and then you play um one of the other fours we've talked about say a hero of blade hold um they might still be able to kill you before your hero of blade hold kills them um whereas ravagers will just lock them out of the game but the reality is most decks in cube at this point are playing to the board and because most decks in cube are playing creatures on the board people also play more removal so you're not really in a spot almost however you build your deck where you're just going to be like yes i'm guaranteed to be ahead on board on turn four and then my armageddon is going to be great um games don't really play out like that sometimes you're going to be behind um you need to be able to answer threats and you need to you're you need cards that are going to work well whether you're ahead or behind, and that very much isn't Aslan Destruction. No, yeah, that makes a ton of sense. So I'm kind of interested from your point of view, Dan, as someone who has spent more time building cubes. Um, how much support do you think you need for, for your white aggro section? How, how much is that something you're actively looking to push? One of the issues I come across in, when building a cube is kind of just like white, kind of t- white aggressive decks just kind of take care of themselves like like you do definitely need like like if it's something you want to support then you should put in good cards for it but i don't know like annoying creatures with power and toughness just exist everywhere like 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 being serious like 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 things like the good white removal spells the white interaction you're just going to be running in a cube because they're good or like in a generic kind of theming of cube but like in like a good stuff kind of cube like cards like yeah like like you i mentioned mother runes is one of the best ones like you're gonna be running that is just one of the best white cards. Um, you're going to see that all up and down the curve. Like, like the best things that white can do in the in like one and two drops are these aggressive creatures, are these kind of annoying death and taxi style of creatures. Um, so being so, so it's one of these ones where kind of like I'm, I'm looking at my cube and trying to support mono white or trying to support white aggro as much as every other archetype in my cube realistically like half of my 63 cards could go in a white aggressive deck and which is probably more than any other archetype in my cube like i'm looking at that mono red and i don't think i'd probably put half of these in a mono red deck but like i like easily over half i'm looking will just naturally go in a white aggressive deck and that's kind of one of its best qualities i think it's kind of like it can just run there's so many pieces for it naturally in cube because it's kind of what it's one of the things that white has traditionally always been best at. And then when you add these really busted cards like cards with initiative and cards with the monarch, kind of as you said, James, they're just white is naturally best place to support it better than everyone else. So for five years ago, I think it was, or like like four or five years ago, people were complaining that white was the worst color in Magic. I would probably argue if you ignore the first five years of Magic, white is probably the strongest color now. I think that's quite easy to say, which is... Which, yeah. yeah, I kind of buy that. Like, I, I, I maybe not in, like, Commander, I think, is a lot of what people talk about in various spots, but yeah, yeah. in Cube, yeah, absolutely. I think it is one of the best colours, for sure. Yeah, and yeah, um, White Aggro is probably the deck that shows it off, shows off the best. Cool. Yeah, for sure. And the other nice thing, right, is outside of the, like, very aggressive one and two drops, which we said, you know, you need some of, you don't need an off, that's not your whole deck. Um... A lot of these good white cards, you know, obviously, you know, you're putting your swords and your paths and your thieves in every white deck, but you should put Parallax Wave in basically every deck that can cast it as well. You know, like the um, these aren't cards you need to put in just to support mono white. They're just good cards, and mon- but mono white makes exceptionally good use of them. No, yeah, hundred percent makes sense. All right, so I think that's gonna do it for our main topic of today. Um, we have one last section for you all, which is what have we been playing? So I think the main thing I kind of want to touch on with this is recently we did a very cool chaos draft. People who've been keeping up with the YouTube channel might know that I, last year at Magicon Barcelona, put together quite a lot of packs. Um, and then because of various things, mainly me getting COVID before Christmas, uh, meant that we only got the chance to do it last weekend um i'll go through some of the packs that we had because this will probably be the la- the spiciest draft i think maybe either of us will do in terms of opening stuff in quite a while um 
So we had Fallen Empires, Ice Age, Homelands, Scourge, Darksteel, Invasion, Eldritch Moon, Kaladesh, Betrayers of Kamigawa, Onslaught, Kanzatok Air, Conspiracy 2, Ravnica, Theros, Saviors of Kamigawa, Original Innistrad, Original Zendikar, Champions? The the other Kamigawa I haven't mentioned yet, Core 2015, Original Conspiracy, Planar Chaos, Odyssey, Legions, and Conflux. And I had a lot of fun with this. I can definitely tell you I did not... We did not open the value of the packs, but that's not the point of a chaos draft. The point is play is scrapping is scrapping to make playables with old and bad magic cards. And I had a fantastic time, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, how did you find it, James? And, and what did you end up in? Oh yeah, I loved it. It was um, it was real like proper nuts and bolts limited. Is how it felt to me, um, and I'm, I really like that. Um, yeah, I ended up in mono black actually, which yeah. was. Uh, <laughs> Not where I expect expected to be. Yeah, I will say more about. I was actually splashing for Grenzo, um, the X red black card off like three mountains, but basically mono black with um, as like a gatekeeper of Malakir. I was attritioning <laughs> people out with yeah. the um, Qu- I'm gonna say this wrong. Kuon Ogre Ascendant. I had uh, it's the black 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 two four where you flip it and oh, not yeah. in the sensible way where they do it now, you have to turn the card upside <laughs> down because yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. old magic. Um, <laughs> and then comes an intri- uh, an abyss, basically. That was cool. Um, yeah, I was just grinding people out with some uh, with uh, the, some like shades where you, you play it back to pump them. Um, it was a lot of fun. No, yeah, it was it. Kind of, yeah. My deck was good. I for a for a deck that was mainly red, I did not get a single piece of removal or red removal less than five mana, which is definitely, I think, where my deck fell down a bit. But I did have a, a very fun card, which I've hadn't really seen before, called Dragon Roost. Six mana for an enchantment. It has pay seven mana, put a five five flying dragon onto play. When I resolved this and then played another land, <laughs> it was really good. <laughs> Card scary in this yeah, format. Yeah. I had to b- board in land description because yeah. I wanted to keep you off. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like, like it's it's the thing about opening old packs, like especially like Fallen Empires and that kind of stuff. Just like being really excited for a vanilla three mana two three is <laughs> yeah, yeah, a weird yeah. feeling. <laughs> Yeah, like I thought I'd played. Uh, I haven't played like a ton of. I haven't played for many of the really old magic sets. And I was kind of like halfway through. I was like, I didn't know magic used to be like this, you know? <laughs> yes. Like I knew the old cards were bad, but like there's like three playable cards in each of these packs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Double yeah. Homelands was uh, yeah, yeah. especially exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, 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 so. Homelands and Fallen Empires only have eight cards in them, so you have to open two packs to make <laughs> playables but it means you uh, maybe get two rares i don't actually know what the correlation is in in those but <laughs> no it was awesome and I, yeah kind of finding a good way to spend a bank holiday weekend yeah for sure that was sick anything else you want to touch on in terms of what you've been playing uh yeah i've been playing a bit of the uh vintage cube on mitgo that's been fun how's Did it going some, uh... are you trophy racing this season yeah, I'm in a, in a trophy race with, uh, with our good friend Daniel Pushman, um, and theoretically our good friend Josh, but he's, uh, he's, he's not really catching up. Which part is, um, which part is theoretical, though? Oh, you know, that I've, I've sounded, but actually, I'm just going to let that lie at this point. That's so harsh, but okay. Yeah. I think I meant to say theoretically with our good yeah, friend yeah. Josh, which would have... Um, which would have come off as less aggressive, <laughs> but you know, I guess I'll I'll leave that to be interpreted. Um, yeah, okay. As, as ever, people want. Um, Shout out Fire Truck Moto. <laughs> Go check them out yeah, on YouTube. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> check out Fire Truck <laughs> because then I don't need to feel bad about this. Um, no, um, yeah, no, I've been having fun with. I did a bunch of meme drafts, drafting the Insidious Root deck earlier mm. in the season. Not good for trophy racing, but a lot of fun. Um, and but yeah, I mean, it's a good iteration of the cube. There's some there's some interesting stuff in there. But um, yeah, basically, the results have mostly been drafting good cards, <laughs> not Insidious Roots. Fair, fair. Um, how much mono white have you drafted? I've had a few decent white aggro decks. I had one interesting deck where I started off trying to draft Academy, got very cut, ended up putting Academy in like six blue cards in my white aggro deck. And it was actually kind of sick because sometimes you just like, 
I had a lot of artifacts, just like random like trade inspectors and equipment and um especially like cryptic coat and that stuff. Um and then I just had a few games where I was like, yeah, tap my academy for like six mana on turn four and cast my culture complete. <laughs> it was great. Okay, yeah, nice. No, I love that. Say the things you can do with mono white. <laughs> mm. Nice. <laughs> Sweet. Well, I think that's going to do it for the day. James, pleasure as always, man. Thank you very much. Yeah, always good. Nice. So, yeah, I've definitely thought I've leveled up my, my game plan, and next time it'll be me cutting the mono-white cards, James. Let's go. Uh, that's sad. That's a real <laughs> shame, actually. Uh, you created a monster. Good man. Good man. Have, yeah. <laughs> No, awesome. Yeah, just leads me to thank you all out there. Thank you very much for listening. Please give the podcast a five-star review if you've made it this far. Like, share, subscribe wherever you're listening to this, and tell a friend. That's always a good one. Until next time, it's goodbye from me, and it's goodbye from James, and we'll see you all soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.